Thank you. It's nice to be wanted. I, I must uh, t tell you, uh, for the people in the back, it's Dick Cavett up here. Um, I, uh, I can't believe that I'm here tonight. Uh, it's not Carnegie Hall that gets to me, but I can't believe that I know Groucho Marx and that he asked me to. Um, to introduce him tonight, and I'll do that as quickly as possible. I, I met Groucho Marx on a sunny Sunday afternoon about 12 years ago. He was coming uh, from the funeral of a great friend of his, a man he's often said was his god, George S. Kaufman. We met on the corner of, 50, of 81st and 5th, and I couldn't believe it, but he asked me to walk down 5th Avenue with him, and we stopped every so often so he could insult a doorman. <laughs> and uh, at when we got to the plaza where he was staying, I assumed that the dream was over and I was trying to think of a way to say goodbye. And he said, in that familiar soft voice that I knew first from the quiz show and then from the movies, well, you said, and he seemed like a nice young man and I'd like to have lunch with you. And uh, we had lunch. It was wonderful. I went home and wrote it down as much as I could remember of it. I remember it for dessert, the captain and the waiter both came over to take his dessert order. And... Uh, Groucho said, do you have any fruit you can recommend to the waiter? And I don't mean the captain here. Um, so uh, it was like that. Uh, the, only, the only sad thing about Groucho's life is that there are so many thousands of funny things that have gone unrecorded. Luckily, there was someone along at the anti-Semitic country club when they told him he couldn't use the pool. And he asked, since my daughter's only half Jewish, could she go in up to her knees? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I would... Thank you for him. Uh, there are a lot of profound things that should be said about Groucho, like the fact that his comedy achieves the level of great art, that he has all the gifts, I think, that a comedian can have. Some of them have a few of them, and he has them all. But uh, that's for people to write about. Um, I was asked to mention one thing. Please don't take any flash pictures. Uh, it makes Groucho dizzy, and, uh, and he could... Uh, it's true, he could fall. And I, he wanted me to mention that, and I said, how can I say that and not alarm the audience? And he said, easy, tell them I'll drop dead if they do. So, <laughs> he's, uh, he's serious, but not when you want him to <laughs> Anyway, to get quickly to the part of the evening that you came and paid for... Uh, I would first like to introduce uh, a few people that should be mentioned now. Uh, among them, Rufus T. Firefly, uh, J.T. Verlupol, uh, J.T. Verlupol, so, hold the applause till the end, please. Uh, Dr. Hugo Z. Hackenbush, Otis B. Driftwood, and Captain Jeffrey Spaulding, the one, the only, Groucho. <laughs> I would like to take a bow for Harpo and Chico. <clears throat> Hello. I must be going. I cannot stay. I came to say I must be going. I'm glad I came, but just the same, I must be going. For my sake, you must stay. For if you go away, you'll spoil this party. I am ruined. I'll stay a week or two. <laughs> I'll stay the summer through. 
but I am telling you, I must be going. I understand that uh, some time ago, Jack Benny played the violin here at Carnegie Hall. And uh, I thought it'd be a good idea <laughs> to take this and break it over my knee <laughs> and then jump on it. <laughs> I've had quite enough of Jack Benny. <laughs> and so is the violin. Well, let's get down to cases. How I got started in show business. I saw an ad in the morning world, which uh, doesn't exist anymore. And hardly do I. <laughs> <coughs> the ad said, boy wanted to sing. I ran all the way from 93rd Street, where I lived then, to 33rd Street and ran up five flights of stairs. I knocked on the door, and a man came to the door wearing a woman's outfit. Not entirely, just lipstick. <laughs> and I realized that that was the profession that I wanted to enter. <laughs> I better start talking about my family first, I guess. There's a, quite a group of them. Can you hear me out there? You're not missing anything. <laughs> Luckily, I can't hear it either. Well, I had a family. I had uh, Harpo played the harp. That was pretty obvious. And Chico was a what they used to call a chicken chaser. In, uh, in England now, they call them birds, which is the equivalent of a chicken chaser in America 50 years ago. He did very well with that, too. <laughs> and Zeppelin was born when the Zeppelin arrived in Lakehurst, New Jersey. He had nothing to do with the arrival. <laughs> My other brother, Gummo, it's not his real name. His real name was, uh, was Milton. It seemed like such a silly name. <laughs> and uh, we used to call him Gumshoes because somebody had given him a pair of rubbers. In a nice way, I mean. <laughs> and that's his name, Gummo Marx. My name, of course, I never did understand. <laughs> I had an uncle named Julius. He was well over four feet. <laughs> and I was named after him because we were under some peculiar impression that he had money. As a matter of fact, my father wanted to throw him out of the house. But my mother said, no, no, I remember I read a story once in which a, a man was supposed to be broke, and when he died, he left a lot of money, so they named me Julius. He never worked anyhow, he was just in the house sitting there. He finally died, and he left a will. His will consisted of a celluloid dickey an eight ball, and three razor blades. <laughs> and besides, he owed my father $85, which he never did get from him. Then we had a sister. She wasn't really our sister. She was an adopted sister. The father of that sister had gotten a look at this girl and fled to Canada. <laughs> and we never saw him again. But the girl stayed with us. And her name was Polly. Polly didn't, she wasn't a bad looking girl, but her rear end stuck away up. 
You could play pinochle on a rear end. <laughs> and Chico was the gambler of the family. He pawned everything. My father was a tailor, and a very bad one. <laughs> and Chico was always short of money, and he used to hawk my father's shears. So whenever my father made a suit, of course, it didn't fit. And the shears would be hanging up in the pawn shop in 91st Street. Chico got a job at Clover Horn and Company. They used to manufacture paper, different kinds of paper. And Chico never brought home a salary, because he was always in the pool room or he was someplace, and he never brought a salary. And my father told him, he says, next week, if you come home without your salary, I'll kill you. They had a very close relationship. <laughs> Chico didn't know what to do. His father was laying for him. In a nice way, I mean. <laughs> and Chico entered apprehensively. And there was my father waiting for him. And Chico says, Dad, I got a great surprise for you. They had a sale today on paper. And I took the three dollars that I was supposed to bring home, and I bought this paper. And my father opened it, and it was toilet paper. <laughs> it was the first time we had ever seen toilet paper in our life. <laughs> we had always used either the Morning World <laughs> or the Herald Tribune. And when I was real young, before that, I used to smoke it. I'd smoke it up into a small bowl and then light it. It was very good. <laughs> it was a very peculiar family. I had an uncle who was a chiropodist. He would come to your house and he had a small suitcase and he would cut your toenails for 25 cents. Then he got a job. Because <laughs> there's not much money in cutting toenails for 25 cents. And it was cold, it was winter. So he got a job setting fire to hotels in the Catskills. <laughs> then he was so good at this, that they finally transferred him and they gave him a job in the Adirondacks <laughs> where they had much bigger hotels to buy them. <laughs> he finally wound up in Sing Sing. Marvin Hamlish. That must be you, huh? <laughs> oh, this is Marvin Hamlish. I'm going to sing you a song written by my good friend, Harry Ruby. It's called uh, Timbuktu. Are you ready to play this? Song? Always ready. Yeah. Long ago in old New Amsterdam, there lived a cousin of the Duke of Buckingham. His friends knew Buckingham to be a sport. So they cut the ham and called him Buck for short. One day Buck met a little cluck and he whispered, Ducky dear, in the accents loud and clear, please marry me, my dear. She replied, I will be your bride, but there must be no delay. So they were buckled up that day. Soon they had a little bucks to know how fast they grew. There was one buck, two buck, three bucks, four bucks, no one knows how many more bucks. Mrs. Buck would play the ukulele every morning or two. And while old man Buck was singing, all the little bucks were bucking, ringing. 
When they had eggs for breakfast, Buck was out of luck. Each buck would eat a dozen eggs, and a dozen cost a buck. The landlord came to raise Buck's rent, but he couldn't raise a sou. So he backed out the motor truck, and he said goodbye, said good luck, and he said good luck, he said goodbye, and he said to Tim Bob to I'm off to a few words in there, but it's such a crazy song it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I used to live in a street called 93rd Street, and there was a girl there that I was stuck on. She was almost 15 years old. And I used to go out every morning and buy bread for my mother. And I used to get the stale bread because it was four cents, and the regular bread was five cents. So in no time at all, about four months, I had saved 70 cents. <laughs> and I was stuck on Annie Burger. She had a great pair of legs. And I used to watch her walk upstairs. She lived on the floor above us. <laughs> So one day, after I had the 70 cents, I said, why don't I take you to the theater? I had it all figured out. 10 cent car fare for two, 10 cents for car fare coming back, and 50 cents for two seats in the third gallery. Now, when we got to the theater, that was Hammerstein's Victoria Theater, there was a fellow selling sauerkraut candy in front of the theater, and it was a nickel bag. And she said, gee, I'd love to have some of that sauerkraut candy. Well, I only had 10 cents left by this time. So I bought her a bag of this candy. Now, we're sitting in the gallery so high, you couldn't even see the actors. And she starts eating the sauerkraut candy. And I can hear her, and I can't hear the actors on the stage. <laughs> and I could have killed her. I thought she'd offer me a piece. <laughs> but she didn't. So when the show was over, by this time she consumed all the candy, and we got outside and I said, Annie, it was cold, it was real cold, it had been snowing all that day. I said, look, you had sauerkraut candy, didn't you, in the theater? <laughs> you never offered me a piece of the candy, did you? Now I only have five cents left and we got to go all the way to 93rd Street. Now look, I care a great deal about you, but I don't want to walk to 93rd Street. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll toss a kind of this nickel that I had left, and you holler heads and tails. She hollered heads, it came down tails, and she walked home. I didn't see her again for 10 years. Soon we were in vaudeville, and I was a German comedian with a spade beard. I was dressed like my uncle Al Sheen, with Gallagher and Sheen in those days. That was my mother's brother. I don't know if you remember him, but he used to sing, Oh, Mr. Gallagher, oh, Mr. Gallagher, what's on your mind this morning, Mr. Sheen? So I became a German comedian. And we were playing in Shays, Toronto, when the Lusitania was sunk in the First World War. I was supposed to sing a song, a German song. But I was afraid if I did, they were going to kill me, that audience. Now I'm going to sing the song for you now. <laughs> I once knew a woman who couldn't spell cat. Her face was as homely as cinch. That wasn't necessary, that part. Of it. Can, I, can I try it again? Let's keep it on a high basis. Oh. Should I, can I try again? Can I get another crack at it? Okay. Thank you. 
I once knew a woman who couldn't spell cat. Her face was as homely as cinch. In winter, she always wore last summer's hat, and a size 11 shoe was a pinch. When she played piano, strong men would faint, and weak men would cry out in grief. And as for her singing, well, it made you feel that it wasn't so tough to be deaf. But with all these things that the people would say, her voice and her looks couldn't drive them away. Cause, oh, how that woman could cook. Her bread was like angel fool's cake. She could take soup meat and give it one look, and right away it was porterhouse steak. Her Pfannkuchen, what a beautiful dream. Her tripe was like peaches and cream. And with the table between us, she looked exactly like Venus. Oh, love how that woman could cook. Well, obviously, with the Lusitania laying at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, I'd have got killed if I sang that song in Canada. So I put some makeup on him, and I made myself a Jew comedian, which I'd never been. I'd never been a Jew comedian. And I sang this song. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Klein, they lived a life so fine until the relatives came. Uncle and Tante Wolf brought all the little wolves. Like wolves, they lived up to their name. One week when my client started to cry, it looks like the wolves mean to stay. So he told his wife one night that while they were sleeping tight, let's leave them and we'll run away, say. It's better to run to Toronto than to live in a place you don't want to. With 20 wolves in front of me, my house looks like a menagerie. Imagine the chief and the tanta to bring all the wolves from Taranta and oi how they can eat at least a pound of meat, say. They take what they want, what they want, to. just think what the bills will amount to. Every day they're growing more and more. They eat one meal a day, that's right. They start in the morning and finish at night. <laughs> it's going to be a cold, cold wind. And I can't keep the wolves from the door. When I was over in London some years ago, I did a quiz show over there for a while. It wasn't too successful, but the... Uh, the American ambassador, he liked me because I used to be funny and crack jokes. And Jackie Onassis' sister, Razwell, you may have seen her, she's been on TV a few times. She's a very pretty girl. And she had a husband who was Polish. He was well over four feet. <laughs> and I told him a story. This is the story. It's about a, a hooker. You all know what that is, I guess. I'm sure sometime in your life somebody has seen one. It was a story about a girl who picks up a pole and takes him home and feeds him, gives him dinner. They go to bed that night, have a great time. Next morning, she helps him get dressed, puts on his uniform with his big uh, epaulets hanging on, and he starts to leave. And she says, just a moment, what about money? And he says, a Polish officer doesn't accept money. I don't know 
if you remember the Second World War. <laughs> because there's so many now, it's hard to keep track of them. <laughs> well, during the Second World War, <laughs> Hess had been sent by Hitler to try to negotiate peace with Churchill. Churchill at that time was in the projection room at 10 Downing Street running monkey business. <laughs> he sent an orderly to the door and says, time to come back after I sing monkey business and we'll discuss business. <laughs> One night at the embassy, Winston Churchill's daughter Mary was my dinner partner. And when the butler passed around the cigars, he said, take one for me. He said, what? <laughs> what do you want a cigar for? You don't smoke cigars, do you? She says, no, what my father does, Winston. And we play a little game. I said, well, what kind of a game? I take a cigar, and he takes a cigar, and then he bets me a pound, I think was around two and a half dollars. And we bet. Who can hold the ash on the cigar the longest? At this time, he was running the British government. <laughs> no, you never think of a man like that. Trying to win two bucks from his daughter. Speaking of Waterville, there used to be a critic in Chicago when we played there by the name of Percy Hammond. This is about 30 years ago, I guess. He was on the Chicago Tribune. And he reviewed our act. We did a big act, and we had about 25 people in the act. And he reviewed the act. And the next morning, this was the review. He said, the Marx Brothers and their various relatives ran around the stage for almost an hour yesterday afternoon. <laughs> Why, I'll never understand. <laughs> he was a tough guy. During the Second World War, years later, the Chicago Tribune correspondent had died. They had to get a new guy to, uh, to go over and cover the war. And they had a big meeting one day. They had Ring Lardner there. And they had the whole staff of the Chicago Tribune. And somebody suggested sending Percy Hammond over, this critic who had reviewed our act. And Ring Lardner says, no, no, you can't do that. Suppose he doesn't like the war. How many of you have read the George Kaufman book? Nobody, huh? <laughs> he was a close friend of mine. He was a hell of a playwright. And he was also a show doctor. And I remember one of the Bloomingdale department store family was producing a show and opening in Philadelphia. And they invited George Kaufman to come down there and see the show because it needed a little help. And Kaufman went down and sat in the second or third row. And when the show was over, the fellow from the Bloomingdale's, he came down to the audience and he said to George, he said, uh, how about the show? How'd you like it? And Kaufman said, tell you what you do. Close the show and keep the store open at night. I was playing the Palace Theatre once, and Sarah Bernard was on the bill. She was one of the first great stars to play the Palace. She insisted on getting a thousand dollars in cash before she appeared. 
She was old at this time, but they wanted her at the palace just the same. She used to do some scene where she used to lie in a coffin and play a dramatic scene. <laughs> oh, she was alive. <laughs> she only had one leg. Did you know that? <laughs> she was getting $1,000 before each performance. I had two legs, and I was getting $50 a week. Once we were on the bill with, the, with Fanny Bryce. I'm sure a lot of you remember Fanny Bryce. She was quite a performer. And on the bill, too, was, uh, there was an act called Swains, Rats, and Cats. Now, you wouldn't believe that, but that was the name of the act. And they had a miniature racetrack on the stage. And the rats were dressed as jockeys and the cats were horses. It was an incredible act, imagine. <laughs> teaching these, these cats and rats to learn all this. And they wore the uniforms, too. And one day, while they were doing the act, there was a screen came from Fanny's dressing room. And Swain ran in there. And he had a Turkish towel with him. He didn't know what he was going to do. Fanny Bryce is standing on a chair, frightened to death, got her clothes away up. Swain grabs this rat. It wasn't one of the rats from his act. This was a sewer rat that had got into the theater. Well, Swain captured this sewer rat. And the next year, we played on a bill with Swain again, and this rat was now the star of the show. <laughs> When we did Animal Crackers, we needed two minutes for a change, a scenery change. So I wrote a ridiculous poem. And I always think of whether the audience is really listening to the actor on the stage. I wrote the most ridiculous poem you could possibly write and tried it on the audience. And the first 10 weeks that we did the show, we used to get a sophisticated New York audience. And they used to laugh, and they used to applaud at the end. And then you start getting the out-of-towners, people from the Middle West. And they, they thought I was serious. <laughs> and this is the way it goes. Did you ever sit and ponder as you walk along the Strand that life's a bit of battle at the best? And if you only knew it and would lend a helping hand, then every man could meet the final test. The world is but a stage, my friend, and life is but a game, and how you play is all that matters in the end. For whether a man is right or wrong, a woman gets the blame, and your mother is your dog's best friend. <laughs> Then up came Mighty Casey and strode up to the bat. <laughs> and Sheridan was 50 miles away. For it takes a heap of lovin' to make a home like that. On the road to where the flying fishes play. <laughs> then I used to take a chair, which the vaudeville actors used to do in those days. And I would start walking off the stage. And the last line would be, so be a real life polyarch and laugh, clown, laugh. I had a great friend in England. His name was T.S. Eliot, the poet. <laughs> well, there are people out here who might not know that he was a famous English poet. 
As a matter of fact, he was born in St. Louis and moved to England. He wrote me a letter, and he said, I'd like a picture of you with a cigar on it. You know, one of these. So I sent him a picture of me, and he retained it. He says, I want a picture of you smoking a cigar. So I sent him one smoking a cigar, and we got very well acquainted. And I had read up on T.S. Eliot, Mitre in the Cathedral, and a few things like that, and I thought I'd impress him. And all he wanted to talk about was the Marx Brothers. That's what happens when you come from St. Louis. <laughs> well, he was a wonderful man. He was a great friend of mine. But eventually, he died. They had a great memorial, and Mrs. Elliot had asked me to go on the stage and say a few words about her late husband. So I went in around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the stage door was locked, and I went through the front of the theater, and I walked down the aisle. And there was Stygian darkness there, and I couldn't see anything. I don't see too well anyhow. Is there anybody out front? <laughs> At any rate, I finally felt my way down to the front row. And I sat down. And I'm now sitting on... I can't think of his name. It'll come to me in a couple of hours. <laughs> Did I sing, Oh, How That Woman Could Cook? <laughs> no, it was true. I was sitting, sitting on Kenneth Tynan's lap. It was dark. So he says, Take the next seat. So I took the next seat, and I'm now sitting on Lawrence Olivia's lap. <laughs> he says, what are you doing here, Groucho? He says, well, I thought, you know, I was invited by Mrs. Elliot to come over here. I thought I'd take a look at the theater. He says, why don't you get up on the stage and show us what you're going to do? I said, well, I don't plan on doing anything here. Well, if not with all the actors you've got here, you had all the Shakespearean actors in England, and I was an old vaudeville ham. So he says, well, get up and say something. You've got to do something for Mrs. Elliot. So I went up on the stage, and this came to me while I was standing on the stage with Olivia down front and Kendall Tyner. It's a tough audience for an old vaudeville actor. <laughs> it was a story about a man who was condemned to be hanged. And the priest had said to him, uh, have you any last words to say before we spring the trap? And the man says, yes. He says, I don't think this damn thing is safe. <laughs> I did a bond tour during the Second World War. It was Hope and Crosby and Cagney, most of the big stars. Desi Arnaz. <laughs> yeah, that was one. We were raising money. And we played Boston and Philadelphia and most of the big cities. And we got to Minneapolis. There wasn't any big theater to play there. So we did our show in the railroad station. Then I told the audience that uh, I knew a girl in Minneapolis. She was also known in St. Paul. She used to come over to visit me. And she was known as the Tale of Two Cities. <laughs> I didn't sell any more bonds, but uh, they didn't allow me to appear anymore. In the there were times when I used to wear a, 
a mustache, and there were times when I didn't. I got tired of wearing it, and I would take it off, because if I didn't have a mustache on, people didn't bother me in the street. So one night, I went to the Winter Garden, and the Houdini was appearing there, and I was sans mustache. That means without. <laughs> got to watch yourself in the Winter Garden. At any rate, I'm sitting in the second row, and Houdini is now doing a trick. He would take some needles and put them in his mouth and a spool of thread, and then he would thread the needles. So he asked for a volunteer out of the audience. Now, who do you think went up on the stage? <laughs> and he opened his mouth wide. I want to prove that there's no trickery to this trick. What do you see in there? And I said, Pyre. <laughs> and left the stage. You know, Berlin wrote our first real Broadway play. It's Coconuts. Yeah. And George Kaufman hated music, even when he wrote the Pulitzer Surprise play with Mari Riskin. He didn't like songs because it got in the way of the jokes. So this got Berlin angry. And he went home that night, and he wrote a new song. He said, you didn't like the song in Coconuts. I wrote a new song for you. And he played it for, for Kaufman. And Kaufman said, it stinks. And this is it. Sing it, you fool. Let's hear it. Da 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 da. Not for just a day, not for just a year, not for just a week or something. <laughs> But always. Well, and I were very friendly, and Harry Ruby and I surprised him. We sang one of his songs, which he hated. It was a song from the First World War, and the song went like this. Down below, down below, sat the devil talking to his son, who wanted to go up above, up above. He said it's too slow for me down here, and so. The devil said, listen, lad, listen to your dear old dad. Fantastic. Fantastic. You stay down here where you belong. The folks above you, they don't know right from wrong. To please their kings, they've all gone off to war. But not a one of them knows what they're fighting for. Way up above, they say that I'm a devil and I'm bad. But the kings up there. Are bigger devils than your dad. They're breaking the hearts of mothers 
making butchers out of brothers. You'll find more hell up there than there is down here below. We were sitting at a table, and Ruby was at the piano, and Berlin called me over. He says, if you ever have an urge to sing that song again, if you'll get in touch with me, I'll give you $100 not to sing it. <laughs> but I still sing it. Whereas I think it has four wonderful lines in there, and it applies today just as much as it did 40 years ago. They're breaking. Have you got a key you're not using? <laughs> They're breaking the hearts of mothers. They're making butchers out of brothers. You'll find more hell up there than there is down here below. I knew a fellow named Otto Kahn. He was a very rich man. And he gave a lot of money to the Metropolitan Opera House at one time. And his close friend was Marshall P. Wilder, who was a hunchback. And they were walking down Fifth Avenue and they came to a synagogue. And Kahn turned to Wilder and he said, uh, Marshall? You know, I used to be a Jew. Marshall says, really? I used to be a hunchback. <laughs> now we get to W.C. Fields. He was a friend of mine. He was a great drunk. And if they'd have had marijuana in those days, I'm sure he'd have been using it. <laughs> and he lived in San Fernando Valley. And he always carried a BB gun. <laughs> and he sat in the bushes, and when the tourists would go past, he would shoot at them. <laughs> One day, he allowed me in his house. And he had a ladder there, and it led up to an attic. And in this attic, he had $50,000 worth of whiskey, unopened cases of whiskey. And I said to him, Bill, what do you get that booze there for? We haven't had prohibition in 25 years. He says, it may come back. <laughs> Fields was doing a picture many years ago with a kid named Baby Leroy. And in those days, you had to have a nurse on the set. This was one of the rules in the movie industry. So the nurse had to go to the bathroom. Even nurses do that occasionally. <laughs> and Fields says, look, I'll take care of the kid. You just go to the bathroom. And when she had gone, he took a bottle of booze out of his back pocket and got Baby Leroy dead drunk. <laughs> and they had to close the show for the movie for three days until he sobered up. There used to be a girl actress in Hollywood. She was an actress, a very pretty one, too. And she always wore an anklet. And I have it around here. And on this anklet, it said, Heavens Above. <laughs> Thank you. 
She did quite some business with that ankle. <laughs> well, you want me to leave the stage? I think we'll both go, yeah. Well, I'll go off. Years ago, there were many songs written about mothers. You know, like Mammy and Island Must Be Heaven. Mom, they're making eyes at me, my mother's eyes. But nobody ever wrote any song about fathers. Father was the town shlemiel in almost every place. He was nothing. Mother was the boss. There, I think there were two songs that I remember. Pop Goes the Weasel. And oh, what a crime is my old man. <laughs> now, I remember one more song. It was called Everybody Works But Father. He sits around all day, feet in front of the fireplace, smoking his pipe of clay. Mother takes in washing, so does Sister Anne. Everybody works in our house. But my old man... That was a big hit, that song. And they even sang it in Europe, in Germany. Alle schafft aber nicht Vater, er geht den ganzen Tag herum. In Rauch die verdammte Pfeife, das alles geht drüber und drum. Und Mutter nimmt den Washing, und auch die Schwester an. Alle arbeiten in unser Platz, aber nicht der alte Mann. I have a friend in Hollywood. I think I do. I'm not so sure of him. His name is Harry Ruby. And he wrote a lot of songs that I have sung over the years. Today, Father is Father's Day. And we're giving you a tie. <laughs> it's not much, you know. It is just our way of showing you we think you're a regular guy. You say that it was nice of us to bother, but it really was a pleasure to fuss. For according to our mother, you're our father, and that's good enough for That's good enough for all. Okay. All I can tell you about Margaret Dumont, who was Mrs. Rittenhouse in our picture. We did a picture, it was a war picture. <laughs> and a shell came through the window. And I rushed over and pulled the shade down. And she said, Otis, what are you doing? I said, I'm fighting for your honor, which is more than you ever did. <laughs> then we were on the boat. And I had two suitcases. Mrs. Rittenhouse was in back of me. And she said, Otis, have you got everything? And I said, I haven't had any complaints yet.
I was in a building called the Thalberg Building. It was a building that was built to honor Irving Thalberg, who was our producer at MGM. And a woman backed into the elevator. And uh, this woman was wearing a hat. I have nothing to do, I'm bored. So I take the back of the hat and I push it up. And I turn around, it's Greta Garbo, the biggest star in all of show business. I didn't know what to say. And finally I said, I'm terribly sorry, but I thought you were a fellow I knew from Kansas City. <laughs> I was once invited to Cecil DeMille's projection room, and they were running Samson and Delilah with Hedy Lamar and Victor Mature. I'm sure many of you had seen that picture sometime or other. So and Cecil DeMille came up to me when the picture was over, and he said, uh, how did you like the picture? I said, it'll be a failure. And he said, why? Why will it be a failure? Well, because he got the characters wrong. Victor Mature has much bigger knockers than Hedy Lamar. <laughs> and they never asked me at the Paramount again. <laughs> I remember playing baseball with Will Rogers in Baltimore. In those days, on the Keith circuit, they used to have teams. And uh, our team would be the Marx Brothers and a few other players. And Will Rogers was playing second base. And I got on first base, and I ran to second base, and I slid in there. And Will Rogers was standing about 20 feet in front of second base. And he turned around to me, and he says, you're out. I says, how can I be out? You've got to touch me with the ball on second base, don't you know that? And he said, Groucho, at my age, wherever you stand is second base. <laughs> That's a true story. I've always had trouble with priests. I was married by a rabbi, I think. I'm not sure of that. I think my grandfather had bought a speech for five dollars, and all the brothers used that speech. My dear parents, for many years you have toiled and labored for my happiness. We had no idea what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> but we did the whole thing, and it was only a dollar apiece for each speech. I was in the Plaza Hotel, and there's a priest standing there. And he recognizes me. He says, aren't you Groucho Marx? And I said, yeah. He says, my mother's crazy about that quiz show you do. And I said to him, I didn't know you fellas had mothers. <laughs> and I continued, I said, I always thought it was immaculate conception. Then I was in Montreal. <laughs> I made a quick exit out of the elevator. I was in Montreal, and a priest comes up to me, puts out his hand, he says, I want to thank you for all the joy you've put into this world. And I shook his hand, and I said, and I want to thank you for all the joy you've taken out of this world. <laughs> He said, could I use that next Sunday in my sermon? I said, yes, you can, but you'll have to pay the William Morris office 10%. Yeah. I was in Italy. I was in Rome. Wonderful city. And I just lit a dollar cigar, and I was walking to the corner, and somebody bumped against me. This is a dollar cigar. I wasn't going to let it lay there. So I reached down to pick it up, and I said, Jesus Christ. And I turn around, there's two priests standing next to me. And one of them had bumped against me. 
He reached in here and pulled out two cigars. He says, Groucho, you just said the secret word. I think we ought to sing Show Me a Rose. Ever since songwriters started writing songs, they have written songs about the rose. Red roses, blue roses, old roses, new roses, roses from the north and south and west. But here's the rose song that I love the best. Show me a rose and I'll show you a girl who cares. Show me a rose or leave me alone. Show me a rose and I'll show you a storm at sea. Show me a rose or leave me alone. She taught me how to do the tango Down where the palm trees swayed I called a rose a meal And she called a spade a spade Show me a rose and I'll show you a stag at bay Show me a rose or leave me alone One night in Bixby, Mississippi We watched the clouds roll by I said, my dear, how are you? And she whispered, so am I Show me a rose and I'll show you a girl named Sam Show me a rose or leave me alone Show me a rose, a fragrant rose Make believe that you don't know me Until you show me a rose She has eyes that men adore so, and a torso even more so. Lydia, oh Lydia, that encyclopedia. Lydia, the queen of tattoo. On her back is the Battle of Waterloo. Beside it, the wreck of the Hesperus too. And proudly above waves the red, white, and blue. You can learn a lot from Lydia. When a robe is unfurled, she will show you the world if you'll step up and tell her where. For a dime, you can see Kankakee or Paris or Washington crossing the Delaware. Oh, Lydia, oh, Lydia, say, have you met Lydia? Lydia, the tattooed lady. When her muscles start relaxing, up the hill comes Andrew Jackson. That encyclopedia, Lydia, the queen of tattoo. For two bits she will do a mosaica in jazz. With a view of Niagara that nobody has 
And on a clear day you can see Alcatraz You can learn the law from Libya La 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 Come along and see Buffalo Bill with his class Just a little classic by Mendel Picasso His cap is sporting, exploring the Amazon Is Godiva, but with her pajamas on. La 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 la. Oh Lydia, oh Lydia, say have you met Lydia? Lydia, the queen of them all. She once swept an admiral clear off his feet. The ships on her hips made his heart skip a beat. And now the old boy's in command of the fleet. For he went and married Lydia. I said Lydia. He said Lydia. I said Lydia. He said Lydia. Oh, Lydia. <laughs> Thank you.